It might be a revolutionary way to fly, but it's also probably the slowest in common commercial use. Now it looks like Northern Canada could see the first serious use of airships for cargo. It's an industry looking for its first big break. Lee Selleck reports. When you think about it, helium-filled skycraft are all over the place. At sporting events, floating around for everything from sightseeing to surveillance and they've been with us a long time. This one was used to map the Arctic Ocean in 1958, flying within 800 kilometers of the North Pole. But when it comes to cargo haulers today, the great airships. Well, we are in the air ocean, and the air ocean has one large example. It is everywhere. This is Canada's champion. It's one of the world's most advanced, experimental, lighter-than-air vehicles built in Newmarket, Ontario by 21st century airships. And this is the big American contender from Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works design team in California. Part hovercraft, part plane and part dirigible. They call it a hybrid air vehicle. It's about 60 meters long and could likely carry a three to five ton load. But Lockheed envisions supersized versions, five times this size, with a payload of 500 tons or more. Think 10 American tanks, and operating costs in pennies per ton instead of dollars. Skunk Works is pretty secretive about their project. They've never shown this video publicly, but it miraculously turned up on YouTube recently anyway. Obviously, we have a lot of people working on a lot of different programs. Uh, virtually all of which I can't talk about as a Lockheed Martin person. That's Skunk Works mogul Robert Boyd in Winnipeg recently making a rare public appearance. The occasion was a conference titled Making It Happen, Airships to the Arctic. It's not just the U.S. and Canada that want to make it happen. Mirko Hermann is CEO of Cargo Lifter of Germany. It is capable of lifting whatever you like. We lifted a 55-ton tank moved it three kilometers, so you can imagine, for instance, a balloon as a flying bridge, if you like. So it doesn't have propulsion, you can operate it by winches, uh, and it could help it. the Mackenzie River, for instance. Canada's market has hit the airship industry's radar screen. There's a tremendous amount of need, especially here in Manitoba and in Canada, moving cargo. We know there's a market for moving passengers. There are other missions. There are markets for carrying sensors. The markets are out there. Around the world, the market looks huge, from military uses to transport in the wide open spaces and isolated communities of Canada's north, where so much cargo moves on winter ice roads ice roads that melt sooner than ever as the climate warms. In the Northwest Territories alone, businesses and governments spend about $15 million a year to build and maintain ice roads. Air freight in remote areas is also incredibly expensive. Two years ago, diamond mines in the Northwest Territories spent about $100 million to move stranded supplies, including 15 million liters of fuel. Canada's unofficial ambassador of airships has explored their market potential. It should be quite profitable. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the north of Canada, my estimate is that we could use at least 150 airships very, very easily. So send them to me now, <laughs> right? Sure. Dale so, Booth is a business sure consultant here, whose passion is improving remote Aboriginal communities, and he is fired up about airships in northern Ontario. A lot of economic activity that could happen as a result of, uh, of having a transportation system like this. I mean, we built Canada on the railroad, right? Canada was built because a railroad went through this town and went all the way out to the west coast, right? So if we can uh, start looking at how we can, you know, build the sort of the sky railroad in, into northern, uh, northern Ontario. He sees new houses, vehicles, cheaper food, and more variety of goods. Being able to uh, uh, create an economic activity so that, you know, some guy's dad has a job, right? So they can go and they can participate in the Canadian way of life. I think these, this airship is really key to all that, especially in northern, northern Canada. Transportation companies in the Northwest Territories are also interested. Bradenbury Expediting is the biggest logistics company in the NWT. 
Now, we'd like to see airships operationalized in the new prototypes up in northern Canada. Stuart Russell says that testing would benefit both northerners and airship developers and predicts it could happen within three years. The information I've seen says 2011 you could see a 20 ton or 50 ton unit operating somewhere. We will eventually bring one up. We're going to fly uh, the next airship that we finish off right now. We're going to fly that to Winnipeg and probably up north a bit too. One of the big advantages airship builders predict is that they will be cheap to fly. The man behind 21st century airships should know. So far, Hook and Colting has built 14 of them. The operational cost of a heavy lift airship uh, compared with a helicopter is probably between one eighth to one twelfth of the operation cost for a helicopter. Uh, that's huge, but also Helicopters are restricted to the distance they can fly, to the duration, and to how much they can lift. Uh, the fuel efficiency and the maintenance, uh, maintenance of helicopters are, is extremely expensive. You can't buy and fly any of these airships yet. They're all test vehicles. And big as they are, they're small as far as cargo airships go. Colting is more cautious in his timetable. Heavy freight that will be at least five, six years. Do you demonstrate and you learn from it? Because you cannot build a 40 ton airship right off. That would be a disaster because there will be things that you haven't thought of. Colting believes in taking small steps because he's seen what overreaching can do. It's money. Uh, for example, we we have, during the time that we have been in operation, since 88, there have been a number of companies that uh, have started with airships. They have been very well funded and they have gone bankrupt. I can mention at least four companies that have gone bankrupt. We are, we have been profitable since uh, 96. So why is it so hard to raise money to develop airships? I think people conjure up still images of the Hindenburg. But flammable hydrogen hasn't been used in airships for 70 years. And I can tell you, please forget this picture. Mirko Herman would like people to forget the sight of cash burning too. And much more recently, that's the story of cargo lifter of Germany. They raised over 300 million euros, and uh, some of them, some of the commenting people say they burned it. I say they spent it. It is only burned if they do, if you don't take the lesson out of it, or if you don't continue with the knowledge you gained. He says the new company is better focused, but the new cargo lifter is still cash poor, and other airship companies have missed their targets too. One of them is Skycat, a British company that's been touting its airships in the Northwest Territories. Despite its stunning prototype, Skycat is fighting for its very life. It's embroiled in a patent infringement case leveled by Lockheed Martin. There's more intrigue. The first production models of Lockheed's airship are reportedly destined for Edmonton and service in the north. Skyfreighter Canada, which has close ties to Lockheed Martin, plans to set up shop at the Edmonton International Airport. But both companies declined interviews at the Winnipeg conference. The more hush-hush and confidential these discussions seem to get, the more I feel it's very close to some sorts of announcements coming forward. Close, always close. It seems certain that Canada will be their first market and their first big test. It's just a question of when and who will be the first to revolutionize the transportation industry with a craft that withstands the rigors of weather and heavy lifting. Lee Selleck, CBC News, Winnipeg.